So I like to uh, record things just for my own, um, you know, self-improvement over time. And then my style is to walk around the classroom. And so this is going to be a little bit more challenging than most classrooms. And so I could certainly talk about this for two hours, um, but this slide deck I've been cutting down from earlier this morning. And so I might be skipping over some things in the interest of time if I find the pacing is off. And so I designed this for two audiences, one primarily students and one uh, of primarily faculty. And so I'll be switching uh, between two things, um, the design of the course and the philosophy behind um, data computing in society, as well as some actual modules and material from the course. Okay, uh, so I usually begin with administrative work and I like to have surprise in my slides. Uh, the course is generally taught at nine o'clock in the morning. So you have students sort of trudging in from the various corners of the campus um, and varying degrees of sleep. And so um, I usually assign uh, reading. And so this is your reading um, due next week. Um, but these materials talk about data science in general and data science as a profession, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, is poised to grow over the next 10 years, 35.2%. Uh, uh, and so regardless of your discipline, uh, data is all around us and data skills are becoming essential skills regardless of discipline, be that in the STEM disciplines or outside of the STEM disciplines. And so do it early and do your happy dance, as I tell my students. Uh, so I always begin with a dad joke, part of that surprise. So I'll try it out on you. My daughter's going to groan. Um, so did you know that French fries weren't cooked in France? So where were they cooked? What do you think? Where? Idaho? Nope. They were cooked in Greece. <laughs> Thank you for answering. So big girl. All right. So usually there's one student whose parents have told them these things. So the key question first will begin, what is data science? And it's basically the confluence of four major areas, uh, visualization. And the purpose of that is twofold. One, uh, to help guide your model decisions that you're gonna apply to your data, as well as for the reporting and the communicating of those insights, those nuggets of information hiding within the data uh, that you extract. We also have mathematical tools, which are primarily probability and statistics, uh, which I teach the students uh, the full complement appropriate uh, to the course. And then there's data analysis and data processing. That's the transformation, the operating on your data. And one of the key things about this processing is that you're throwing away some parts of your data and you're highlighting other parts of your data. If you make the wrong choice, then the statement you're making will not apply from the system uh, that sourced this data. And then lastly, we have the application domain. That's sort of obvious from its name, but let me pose the question to you. Where do you think you spend most of your time in a data science problem in these areas? Where do you, where would you think? I know you, <laughs> where would you think? In the application domain, because inextricably linked from your data is how it was collected, what it means, the practices, from those areas that source the data. And I'll have some examples of that. And so the challenge of this course, I derive my motivation for how I teach uh, from ideas espoused in this book by Daniel Pink. I highly recommend it. Um, and it says, it talks about three things that motivate people to excel, to go beyond. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so in everything that I do in the design of this course and all my courses, uh, I engage those three things. Autonomy concerns uh, bounded choice, not free choice, because at the end of the day, they can't do anything they want to. Uh, and it might include an experimental um, form or flavor to all of the projects in the course. And with this, students engage the top two parts of Bloom's taxonomy, evaluate and create, so they choose the tools that they apply and they have to justify why they chose that collection of approaches and tools and also understand the physics, the interactions between them and what that brings to bear in terms of the analyses uh, and what uh, propagates forth in the data. They're not used to looking up there, looking down there. Usually the screen is lower, so still getting used to this uh, room. And then of course, mastery, uh, giving the students 
many opportunities throughout the course of the semester uh, to show what they know, to be proud about it. And so we do all sorts of things from in-class workshops, presentations, frequent uh, interaction, as well as uh, for exam review, I gamify it with a Jeopardy tournament um, for points. And so this last one, purpose, is really, really important I found to students, and that's purpose, and that's um, having the students work on something that matters to them. Because when it matters to you, it's a little bit different in terms of the effort, the investigation, and the work uh, that they often, I found, put into their work, into their assignments. Now, of course, this is challenging because the course has no math requirement, and the goal is to attract and bring up to speed, if you will, in data science, uh, students who are traditionally not taking this type of course. That's the humanities and the arts, those outside of the STEM disciplines. And so there's necessary theoretical material and convincing them that probability is a lot of fun, which it is, I seem to think so. Also, it's important that they understand the underlying machine on which they're running their computations. So we have a number of modules about computer architecture, about networking, about processes, all of the things that impact the mechanization of your algorithms. We also instill important skill sets about data science, and those are the practices, but we also talk about other social issues, namely privacy, bias, and equity and inclusion. And so my goal with this, and my first day of class, I assign the first project, is to get them doing data science from day one, which I do. And so I'll also walk you through uh, an example process, but I'd be remiss if I didn't give you a little bit of information about the cohorts of students um, that I have this semester. And so this information, um, right now we have 31 students, no longer 33, but this represents a snapshot in time, uh, the second week into the semester. And as you can see here, um, about half of the students are undeclared. And that means the math background is gonna vary broadly across the class. And so the undeclared is where the mode is, but my goal is to increase the probability mass across that broad swatch of majors to increase that diversity. Now, when we look at the year or the status of these students, if we look at first year students, that's roughly 40%. And if we look at first year and sophomore, that's a whopping 70% of the class. And so here it skews more, uh, more mass in the first and second year, but also something in this course should be offered uh, for the juniors and the seniors. And in fact, last fall, when I taught this course the first time, my strongest student was an art history major. And she lamented at the end of the semester, darn it, I'm graduating. I wish I'd taken this course earlier. I would have at least minored in data science. And so um, that made me feel really good that at least anecdotally, um, the course um, targeted the right level of student and the right uh, type of access. And so there's no math prerequisite. And if we look at the math background for the students in the class, and I require them with lots of nudges uh, to take uh, the math placement exam if they haven't, and that's not to give a barrier to entry to the course, it's just so that we know what we're dealing with, right? How can we best support the students? And they're roughly clumped into three groups, those who've had placement into pre-calculus, those for calculus, and those who are below that, uh, more modest in their backgrounds, business math uh, and algebra. And so the challenge, if you could imagine, in a science course is how do you take off gently enough that you appeal to the more senior students who've had more math background, as well as encourage those who have a more modest math background. So that's the big challenge. But at the end of the semester, and I'm very deliberate about this, and I have lots of shameless pitches throughout the semester about signing up the class as many as possible at a minimum for the minor in data science, because it's that important, um, regardless of your discipline. And so here, we'll take a look at the data science process. And I begin my first class with this slide. There are lots of non-obvious places where you can find a lot of rich and interesting data science problems. Take healthcare in the upper left, your left. There are lots and lots of analyses that you can perform uh, that add value to clinical data. That's this real-time data. And in the ICU, intensive care unit and hospitals now, they use telemetry. 
But what I'm talking about here is this longer term monitoring all of these wearable devices. Now with that, what you're concerned of uh, about is anomaly detection. But doing this day to day, every physician will tell you fullness. Um, I'd love to know what's happening at like 8 p.m., right? Why is your heart rate dropping or why is your, your pulse dropping, for example? And take agriculture, that's where my research is pivoting. Um, a farm field is instrumented and it's part of agile agriculture or digital farm management. And with that, you can increase specificity, real-time measurements of things that impact soil quality as well as yield and quality of your produce. Now with a growing population, the name of the game is being more efficient, increasing this yield and quality. Now there are lots of factors that can impact that, but on the back end, what this allows you to do with increased specificity, apply interventions like apply nutrients um, to locales in the field, uh, as well as pesticides. And so if you're familiar with agriculture, I came from a land grant institution in my previous institution. Um, when you apply nutrients bl um, blanketed to a field, um, when you have precipitation events, you're going to get runoff and that poisons uh, water supplies. Moreover, pesticides, many of them, over long-term use, uh, consuming products that were to which our pesticides were placed can lead to lots of human health issues. And so what this allows you to do is apply those nutrients with increased specificity where it's needed, saving on the amount of these things that are applied. And then urban planning here, uh, we have a cityscape and they're instrumented often with cameras that do real-time tracking of things like pedestrian traffic and automobile traffic. And that has lots of utility in things like altering your traffic signals uh, to better traffic flow, be that route around areas of high congestion or time them in such a way that you increase the traffic flow. Moreover, for pedestrian walkways, altering the timing of those signals uh, to better accommodate pedestrian traffic as well. And then lastly, public policy, you find a lot of data science. In fact, um, this allows you in the Bureau of Labor and Statistics on a federal level does exactly this. You can implement real time metrics that help you measure the efficacy of programs and interventions where municipalities apply taxpayer dollars. So now you can correct course more readily versus at the end of the budget year asking how are we doing? So there are lots of places where you find data science more than just you might think a table of information. So let me throw the question to you. In a data science problem, where do you think we begin? Where do we begin? With all these things like the tools, the domain, the models, the processing, where would you begin? How about you? Define the problem, okay. And part of defining that problem, thank you, is asking the question. Because when you ask a question, that shapes everything else that follows in your analysis. And that question frames the problem that you're going to solve. Because in this problem, for example, in the agriculture domain, well, why did my lettuce yield decrease from last year to this year? And so you have these questions and these questions asking the right question is really, really important. The data wants to tell you something about the system, but you have to ask it the quote unquote right question. And so once you ask the question, you have to pursue getting this data. This data might be data that you curate, but oftentimes it's data that someone else has curated and they do it for their own purposes, not for yours. And so this is gonna be messy. And one of the things I talk about frequently with my students is that the real world is very messy and interesting. Things aren't given to you perfectly, and that's sort of an affront to many students the first time they encounter this. And so part of that messiness uh, concerns visualization, exploring the data. What is the data you think trying to tell you? Because this type of exploratory analysis will help inform the choices that you're gonna make when it comes time to select and apply a model. Now, being in that it's not messy, some of this data is gonna be pretty ugly. You're gonna to have to find and fix the so-called blemishes in this data, as well as integrate two types of data that weren't originally intended uh, to be together. And so once you do all of this, now it's time to extract your insights. You're gonna model the data. You're gonna pull out of this data those important nuggets 
that tell you something about the system that gave you that data. And then after that, a really important part, we're not done, is communicating the results. Because you have to take into consideration your audience and you need to articulate it in a way that's gonna resonate with them. And so if you were testifying before Congress, you'd give a different uh, presentation from if you were in a room full of agricultural scientists, for example. Okay, any questions? No, all right. And so when you look at data science as a field, it's still changing and definitions are uh, changing. Across the board, these are similar types of roles. Now, depending on the organization that you work for, they might call different things data science. There are some quote unquote data scientists that deal with the data collection and the repairing of those blemishes in this imperfect and messy data. There are some that do the exploration and there are others, the machine learning folks uh, that spend their time developing these models that extract the insight. All across the board, increasingly, as we deal with more and more complex data collected across various domains, no one person deals with all of it. While it is useful to understand it, it's too big for one person uh, to do everything. So then usually at this point, I have some examples of job ads for my students. This one is from uh, Mayor Wu's office in Boston, and it deals with voting data. Right? So this is very, very serious. And I use this to motivate that some types of data is wrapped up in a lot of federal law. So not only do you apply your craft to doing your analyses, but you have to be compliant with what the law dictates or you'll get yourself into a fair amount of trouble. This other one um, is from DoorDash and I chose that because students understand DoorDash. Uh, and with this, you're dealing with high volumes of data and there's a lot of money wrapped up in this as well. And so I encourage my students to go out and look at various examples of what data science is across various organizations. And so an illustrative example, I look at inflation and the first project deals with this inflation and inflation, as my finance friends tell me, is when too many dollars chase too few goods. So the price goes up. Now, when households experience inflation, that changes consumer behavior. Maybe you used to buy brand names and you buy the generics, or maybe some of those wants, um, you kind of forgo those uh, for some of the needs, the staples. And so one deep question uh, that I pose to them, is the cost of spaghetti and meatballs, is it getting out of hand? Okay, well, spaghetti and meatballs is a staple. And if you pair it with broccoli, well, that hits all the food groups. It's relatively inexpensive, and you can find it in just about every market that you visit. So one of the questions then, okay, is it getting out of hand? Is it just getting too high? Is inflation really impacting uh, this household staple across the United States? So the next question, of course, getting the data, and let me pose this to you as I would to my students, where would you get data about spaghetti, meatballs, and broccoli? Where do you think? The grocery stores, if you walked into Walmart and you asked them, can you tell me about your prices? They're gonna say, no, because they consider it their competitive advantage. If you go to a small market like Gallo Foods down the road on uh, Main South, they're gonna say no, because they're afraid that the deals they're getting from distributors are different from the deals someone else is getting. So unless, unfortunately, you're on the data science team for these organizations, 100% of the time, the answer is going to be no, right? Because Walmart doesn't want Target knowing what it's doing with its pricing. Okay. So fortunately, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, it's the data science research arm that does all this curating and gathering of data that the Congress uses when they're crafting legislation. One of the things they calculate is the so-called consumer price index. And that represents uh, the average price for various metropolitan areas around the United States for a number of consumer staples. Of course, spaghetti is there, uh, meatballs are there, beef, uh, as well as tomatoes to make the sauce. Now, of course, with this, they make this, curate this data for their own purposes. They don't do it for our purposes. And so the students, once again, have to deal with the messiness of this data. And so they go to look at the data. What does it look like? 
how do they report it, and how do they integrate it together to reflect the reporting period prescribed in the project assignment. And so here, it's reported monthly. Each item is maintained in a separate table. It's an Excel table. Uh, and some of the items are missing entries. Now, at some point when they're doing the project, um, they're going to select a model. And I give them a model. And this model is something very simple. We call the SMB index, the spaghetti meatball index. And this is just the price of the primary ingredients for this staple meal. And when they go off and they look for these ingredients, oops, they realize that broccoli is missing for that reporting period. What do they do? They have to find a proxy from it. So they go off and they look for the producer price index, but this is reported in terms of 100 unit and not single unit as uh, the Bureau of Labor S uh, and Statistics reports. So they have to transform this. They have to fix that issue so that it matches up with the data that they got from BLS. Okay. And so once they do that, of course, they communicate the results. And I give a talk about what not to do uh, when you present. I call it how to make a presentation that sucks. And I do lots of things with the hopes that they'll learn from those things, what are bad practices, with the hope that they'd focus on good communicative practices. Any questions? No? All right. And so they plot a graph, and this graph was registered in time over the reporting period from September uh, to June the following year. And then they'll plot all of the ingredient prices uh, for this staple. And then they'll plot their SMBI index. And then most of the time they'll notice, wait, something happened here. And so one of the questions they would ask, well, what in the world happened? There's something interesting about that particular point in time. So I pose the question, well, what if oil prices climbed at that juncture? And by oil, I don't mean olive oil or cooking oil. I mean crude oil. Well, what does crude oil have to do with spaghetti, meatballs, and broccoli? Well, they have to go off and investigate that. And so I explained to them a little bit about supply chain. Oil, one of the derivatives is fuel, and diesel fuel powers these um, big rigs, these 18-wheelers. And when goods and services come into the ports, uh, those ports are coastal, and then they make their way into the interior uh, through these trucks. And so if the cost of diesel fuel goes up, they pass that cost on to the distributor, which reflects is reflected and passed on to you, the consumer, when you complain about why eggs cost so much. Okay. And so when you look at these trucks to give you a sense of how much this diesel fuel um, impacts the cost of goods, and I had to write this down, um, a, a big rig gets about 5.6 miles per gallon on average. Um, they have 300 gallon tanks and diesel fuel is about $4 a gallon. So you're talking about 6,000 per tank full in order to get 1,600 miles halfway across the country. So that's a lot of cost and it's passed on to you, the consumer. And so the cost of gasoline, they go off and they find some other charts and they notice that this dramatic increase in crude oil prices, which this graph reflects, roughly coincides with the increase in their SMB index. And so one of the things I teach them with this is you have to go off and find other information to augment your analyses. Uh, and you're looking for coincidences between these different measures. Now, at this juncture, we call them coincidences, but once we go through the machinery of probability and statistics, uh, they know about entropy and they know about correlation. Okay. Uh, so here, they also go off to other economic data from trading economics. This is the inflation chart. And as you can see, right around that period, inflation started to take off. Now, 10% inflation is absolutely huge. Baseline, they like to have about 2 2.5% in a decent economy, normal economy. And so here, one of the questions I asked them, do you see any coincidence between your SMB index and these other pieces of information that you've gathered? And invariably, they say yes, and they use very descriptive language because at this juncture, we haven't yet covered uh, the rigorous statistics that measure these coincidences. And so we revisit a lot of concepts throughout the course of the semester with increasing sophistication as we introduce these tools uh, that allow them to better quantify what they're seeing in terms of relationships 
uh, between things, a very important aspect of analysis. And so typically they'd say something like the following in their reflection on the projects, according to my index, it certainly got out of hand. It was coincident with the run-up of oil prices or the spike in inflation. Okay. And so with this, this is all in the first week of the semester. And it's really important for me to get them up to speed in doing something from day one, from week one rather, uh, that looks like data science. And then we revisit various aspects of this data science process that I showed last time in more detail uh, with more of the tools as we introduce them. Okay. And so one of the motivating set of questions, how strong is this relationship? Now at this juncture, they don't really know, they can't measure that, are there any other relationships? And is this predictive? Is this relationship so strong that seeing one allows you to be sure that something else is going to happen with the other? And so we talk about that uh, in the context of more sophisticated analyses. And this temporal relationships has to do with lag. Does something happen at the same time or does it happen some window of time before? And so how do we do this? We use a tool called Rapid Miner. And Rapid Miner is a graphical environment. It started at University of Dortmund and it's enjoyed commercial success. And it's a visual environment for laying out computations for mechanizing the processing of data. And so here, I like to encourage them to go off and find for themselves because I can't possibly teach you everything in Rapid Miner. You're going to have to be empowered to look things up for yourself. It's impossible in one semester or even two semesters, I dare say. And so here, this is what Rapid Miner looks like. And when you start it up, you start a so-called process. And this process gives you a design window. And in this design window, you lay out graphically a pipeline of processing steps, which collectively form your processing. And so your processing pipeline goes in here. And then in this um, environment, there are interfaces in the upper left and the upper right. On the upper left, you're bringing data into Rapid Miner. In the upper right, you're sending data out of Rapid Miner. And that output could be visual, plot a graph, or it could be send it to some computer, to a file system, uh, to a data center somewhere. And so from there, uh, we talk about what our pipeline looks like, and it's organized as a graph, which is a very important data structure in computer science. And a graph consists of a bunch of blocks uh, in Rapid Miner, and each one of those blocks uh, corresponds to some function, some processing step, and it has a bunch of edges or arrows, and those arrows represent data flow. And so an arrow inbound to a block represents data coming into that processing step, an arrow coming out of a block in that direction is the result of that processing step. So literally in Rapid Miner, you select from a palette of operators and you wire them together to implement your mechanization of a set of processing steps. And so I said the same thing. And so here we have a bunch of data source types, your repositories, but down below we have the operators. And there are probably about 200 operators that come with Rapid Miner when you first install it, but there are also a suite of additional libraries of operators that others have written that you can download and add to um, both free as well as for pay. There are always opportunities to pay for things. Um, as a student or a faculty member, uh, Rapid Miner is available for free. Uh, and the mechanism for that is a one-year annual renewable license, as long as you're still a student or uh, faculty or staff at a university. And so I explained to them that in my class in 103, uh, we study the behaviors of these operators uh, and some of the underlying background in terms of the probability and statistics. But in DS125, you implement these yourself, these behaviors, uh, using the Python language at the moment. Okay. And so one of the key topics uh, in my class concerns so-called datafication. And that is the mass scale instrumentation of just about everything that you're doing when you engage with computation. And so almost like the song, I'll be watching you, um, everything you share, every call you place, everything you buy, every site you see, every click you make, I'll be watching you. And so my goal with the students is to not just tell them about it, 
but have them experience it for themselves. And so one of the things we talk about is a computational background um, of all of the mechanisms in place that they use for instrumentation. And this includes things like internet cookies, cross-site cookies, as well as other more vendor-specific things like Apple's ID that they use for tracking, as well as Google's advertising ID. And so we explain to the students, I explain to the students, that seemingly mundane activities are heavily instrumented. Things like your online shopping, just walking around using your cell phone, uh, particularly your smartphone, or something as mundane as sitting down watching TV with your family. And so for the shopping, of course, uh, these vendors of credit cards, uh, your information is sent to these monitoring agencies. And they're not just computing FICO scores, they're selling your information to various financial institutions. That's happening all the time. In addition, for geographic location, as you're walking around, your cell phone triangulates with two cell towers uh, to determine what your lo location is on the surface of Earth's uh, geography. And so what can we do with this? And they don't usually believe me. Uh, so those who are iPhone users, I tell you the commands to go ahead and look at all the statistics that are collected on your location. And so it maintains the top K locations that you visit, and it knows which supermarket I go to. I go to Clark very regularly. Which gym do I go to? And so certainly you can turn this off and you can scrub it, but imagine some app running on your phone that had unadulterated access, uh, like TikTok, <laughs> uh, to <laughs> all of your information. What could they do with that? Now you might think, boy, well, that's, that's no, not so bad. I can get things like coupons for stores in certain locations, but what else could happen with your information? You deserve and are entitled to privacy. And so another one, watching TV, I call them nosy TVs, not smart TVs. And these TVs, you'll notice, you get a lot of serious computational machinery in a very, very low price. Now, this particular one, not to pick on Best Buy, but that's, you know, that's a lot of TV for a very small price. Well, why is that? Well, if we go to big TVs, um, I was in Walmart the other day, and while $1,000 is you know, a hefty chunk of change, um, it's still a lot, not that much for the amount of TV that you're getting. So this is 86 inches, which I call Shaquille O'Neal size, right? Shaquille O'Neal is seven foot one, this is seven foot two. That is an absolutely huge TV for $1,000, and it has a lot of capability in it and a lot of beautiful graphics capability. Well, why is it that this is so inexpensive? Because they're taking a loss on the actual hardware, because what they're really after is your data. There's something called automatic content recognition, which most of the cases, it's enabled. You have to go through and fish through, get another you know, graduate degree to fish through the interface to go find how to turn it off. But what automatic content recognition does, it contacts a server with an enormous database of various content. And when you're watching something, this is at the TV device. This is not the individual application. So this is cross application. So you might say, hey, I'm a Hulu subscriber. And I also maybe watch through Verizon's cable package, but it's at the device. So every audio, every visual that comes out of this device is being tracked against this database so they can figure out what you're watching, regardless of which services you're subscribing to. Now, of course, this is where the real money is. It's not the $1,000 for the TV. It's not the $379 or what have you. They don't really care about that. What they care about is selling your information. And so whether you realize or not, a lot of what you do is being collected, analyzed, and monetized at your expense. Okay. And so it's turned on by default. Another aspect of datafication is the private and the public sector's use of this data. There's a lot of mass scale digitization going on uh, in things like policing um, and things like real estate sales. Whether you know it or not, everything you're doing is being instrumented and monetized. And it's not just the first order organization, 
but they do something with it and then they pass it on to the next one and to the next one and to the next one who you don't even know who uh, they are. And so we have two experiences in my class as project experiment experiments, the so-called Facebook experiment and the predictive policing experiment. And with the Facebook experiment, we all create Facebook alias profiles, they are the fake profiles, and we brainstorm in class on a topic of discourse. Uh, last fall, it was Second Amendment. This spring, it was the 2024 election. And so I randomly assign viewpoints, conservative or liberal, to the students in the class. And we have reading assignments about articles uh, to get talking points of each of these sides. And then they go on and make a minimum number of posts and gestures over the course of a week and a half. And they're recording what content was inserted into their feed at the beginning of the experiment and how it changed over time. Uh, moreover, we asked them to go and search the web for products that someone of that viewpoint might search for. And we look at the impact of what your browsing behavior is versus what's inserted in your Facebook feed. And the general consensus among the students after this assignment from the reflections, I have a reflection in every project experiment is, oh my goodness, I had no idea this was happening. And in a very short space of time, content is inserted and they really drives home for them this experience, and then we have discussion about it. Well, this is just the 31 of us in class over a week and a half. What would happen in a municipality of say 700,000 over years? And so with this, they experience it directly. We have another assignment on predictive policing. And for this, they get to choose their own viewpoint, protagonist or antagonist. And we take a look at various um, crime maps and we look at how those things are used, uh, this datafication. Now, certainly the police uh, record data about contact with individuals and various crimes, but these things are also used for things like sentencing, which can be very, very funky, <laughs> if you use the word. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And so with this, of course, some of the students are for it, some are against it, some are disturbed by it. Um, but it allows them to directly experience uh, what the impact is uh, for this data collection and this processing over time. Okay. And so privacy, bias, and fairness is a big part of the course. It's the third, the last third of the course uh, that we cover. And we give a bunch of examples and we have discussions and projects about it uh, for recruitment. Um, a lot of these data science type techniques are used. It allows you to high volume process a lot of applications. That's a good thing. But one of the problems is, is that this introduces bias. It negatively impacts various cohorts um, in, a neg in a bad way. And so one of the other things we look at is retail. You ever go to one of these self-checkout kiosks and there's this big camera with a screen staring you in the face? Well, one of the applications, they track your retail behavior. Are you actually scanning things? And the interesting part about this is they're looking for honest behavior. But if there's uh, evidence of dishonest behavior, they don't do anything about it. They accumulate the total cost of that loss um, until it reaches felony levels. So then they can really get you, right? And so with this, um, you can record faces in addition to this behavior, and it's for self-checkout, but they're also uh, tracking this retail behavior um, at the cashier. Just because there's a cashier, it doesn't mean that's not being instrumented. And so with this, um, you can record a face, and then the next time that individual and particularly damning someone who might resemble that individual uh, walks into the store, they now alert uh, the staff and then they can trespass you. Now, certainly in retail establishments, um, there's the accommodation rule. It's accessible to the public, but the moment they say you're not allowed to be here, then you're committing a crime should you choose to stay. One of the stories in the news associated with this type of datafication, um, there was uh, a woman who was a lawyer 
at a law firm, and her law firm just happened to be involved in litigation with the parent company that owns Madison Square Garden, uh, the stadium in New York City. Now, she was trying to go to a hockey game, and when she went in, they recognized her, that she works for this law firm, and they denied her access to the hockey game. It had nothing to do with this litigation, but certainly this data passes hands, and the parent company uh, had the wherewithal to go and search for pictures publicly available uh, for all the staff at these firms. So what can you do outside of wearing a mask? <laughs> There's not really much you can do. And so this idea of datification uh, can introduce a lot of issues, and it relates to something in the literature called um, algorithmic hygiene. Poor algorithmic hygiene leads to a lot of algorithmic bias and issues arising. Let's take, for example, a face. When you describe a face in computer vision, you describe um, both the color, the texture, and the shape associated with regions or patches of image. Now you see here these lines, they express relationships, geometric relationships uh, for various patches on the surface of the face. Now, of course, this person depicted, they're facing the camera and you have ambient lighting, but in the real world, in the wild, this is not always the case. There are several factors that can dramatically alter um, the appearance of someone's face uh, from an image. And that includes things like lighting, out of plane rotation. So you rotate outside of the plane of the imaging device um, that can dramatically alter your appearance as well as occlusion, part of the face is blocked. And so here we have a bunch of different pictures that show for individuals, um, lighting changes, orientation changes, adorning masks and things like that. Now I'm not being completely honest with you. This is actually all the same person. And it looks like about four or five different individuals. And this is just to illustrate to you just how dramatically, even for one person, the appearance can change. Now imagine if it's more than one person. And so here I cover as part of my class what I call the anatomy of a learner. And this is a conceptual model that allows you to talk about constituent components that impact these information extraction types of algorithms, these AI algorithms, machine learning algorithms. And the two boxes I've highlighted in the, I don't know if that's pink or red. Mav, is that pink or red? The colored in ones. I, my color, my crayon box had eight crayons, so I always struggle with this. So the two colored in boxes, um, one of them is a set of training examples. That's the historical data that you use to train your models. And the other is a probability distribution over that data. And so you'll notice here, there's an edge that goes from your probability distribution to your training examples. And it's responsible for giving you those values that you measure from your historical data. Now, this probability distribution also has an edge that goes down into your learning model. And this is the new examples that you encounter in the wild when you deploy your model. Now, ideally, the distribution that gives you the historical data and that gives you the new data in the wild, it should be the same distribution. But that's not always the case. And so what ends up happening if this distribution is different, which I illustrate here, you have one distribution, P1, that gives you training examples, and another distribution that gives you the examples in the wild. So if you were going to recognize students at, say, Clark University, you wouldn't train on Clark University student data from their images and then try to deploy that at UNC Chapel Hill, right? It's just going to be different. School colors are different. A lot is very different. And so as these two distributions, your so-called in-sample data distribution diverges more and more from your so-called out-of-sample distribution that gives you your examples in the wild, as they diverge, your learner performs worse and worse and worse. And so here we have our learning algorithm and its responsibility, and I think of learning as function approximation, its responsibility is to search through a family of functions looking for some function that most closely aligns with what you see in your training data. So then when you deploy it, the goal is to strike the right balance such that what you encounter out of sample is very close to what you've encountered in sample. But therein lies the problem. 
this thing relies on your data. And if you have poor hygiene or practices in your data, this learner is going to be drastically wrong uh, in its performance out of sample. And so pre-algorithmic use, we relied on humans and organizations, and there were laws from municipalities and governments in place to kind of bound these errors in terms of the practices. Things like what happens in mortgage and searching for a house, if you are denied for a loan, they're required, the bank, by federal law to furnish the reason why you were denied. It's very, very serious. And this bounds things like equity, transparency, fairness. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But when we go to algorithms, these algorithms increasingly are influencing decisions, like denying someone access to public accommodation facilities, just based on the output of this algorithm, which in itself, there's no magic in it. It's very brittle if the hygiene is poor. And so these algorithms are determining what should happen. And this algorithmic bias, as it's called in the literature, refers to deleterious effects for cohorts of people when there is no relevant difference between that group, those two groups that should warrant that difference in the outcome. And so it's a really, really important problem that's become a very growing focus of machine learning research. And so one example, um, higher interest credit cards. If you have a stream uh, from a TV and you notice they're watching certain type of content, maybe you insert commercials for higher interest credit cards. Now, typically for lower socioeconomic status demographic, they're going to get pitched these higher interest credit cards. Now, of course, some people are going to click and others will not click or you know, bite on these uh, advertisements. Now, of course, these demographically biased ads then, that's gonna reinforce more and more and more. And the problem with this is it's not looking at counterfactuals, right? Any sort of experiment must be falsifiable. You need examples that challenge your assertions to see if it still holds. And so what this happens, do, uh, ends up doing is reinforcing these high interest credit cards. So then more and more, it's gonna pitch them to that demographic instead of saying maybe they have a better credit risk and I should offer them uh, a regular interest rate type of card. Um, policing and judicial systems. Um, urban areas tend to have a different demographic from suburban areas. Um, and when we look at urban areas, urban areas typically have the usual city issues, uh, crime, violence, uh, poverty, and homelessness. Now, of course, when you look at the policing records, there are more arrests and contacts and incident reports related to those things wrapped up in crime, violence, etc. But what ends up happening is this data makes its way into the judicial side, and someone from a certain demographic that's more indicative of an urban environment would tend to get a higher risk score, which results in longer sentences and higher bail. Right. And so, again, this is a, an example of algorithmic biases and longer sentences, higher bail for the same crime. Right. That's really important uh, to remember. And so another one concerns clustering. Suppose you're clustering applications for candidates who apply for a job. Now, of course, if you train this using existing employees, invariably your engineers are going to be primarily male. And they tend to work, uh, tend to be from a very small number of colleges. Um, when I worked at Sun Microsystems, I'd never worked with so many Stanford and MIT grads before in my life. It's just what happened at Sun Microsystems because of the founding of the company. Now, what ends up happening is that when you get new applicants coming in, what happens is you compare that application to a description of the cluster. And that ends up penalizing against female applicants as well as against certain college pedigrees. So you're passing up female engineers and you're passing up engineers who don't go to certain colleges and you're doubly penalizing female engineers who don't go to those colleges. And so again, that's about poor data hygiene. When you're clustering applicants, you don't just look at your employees in-house, you wanna look at other employee profiles as well to broaden your coverage, okay? And so retail theft direction, uh, detection, uh, as we saw with the face example, is very easy to make a mistake, right? And so imagine then 
Um, you only had one person with dreadlocks. And if you're unfamiliar with dreadlocks, this is what dreadlocks look like. Um, it's a cultural thing from the Rastafarian um, religion. I was born in Jamaica and Rastafari is a religion, but certain people adopt uh, this style. Uh, and so with this, imagine then you had a million data points and you were doing this retail um, application and you have 500,000 examples of non-criminal activity and you had 500,000 um, examples of criminal activity in your training data, this box over here. Now let's imagine further that for these examples of criminal activity, um, it just happened that one person had dreadlocks, right? And that's the only descriptor I'm going to give, okay? Well, what happens if someone walks in, regardless of what their appearance is, their demographic, if they have dreadlocks. Essentially, the system's going to hallucinate. I've had that picture before, um, and it ends up saying, okay, dreadlocks, this is a criminal, and this poor person um, gets banned from the store, and they can no longer buy donuts from their local Dunkin' Donuts. Um, perish the thought. And so this is just to say that for this algorithmic hygiene, you really have to examine how you're building these models and how you're going about extracting these insights and what sort of data that you're using. So we have some population and for this population, you can cluster it and partition it into a set of demographic cohorts. It's up to you to go in and then analyze all those individuals in a group and come up with a name or a set of attributes for them. And let's imagine then you had some set of underrepresented cohorts and if you did the percentages, imagine if they were very small percentages of the population. Well, one of the things you could do to try to repair this poor data hygiene uh, is you could boost the number of examples uh, for those underrepresented cohorts. So, you know, a statistician would say we'd wrap a probability around their descriptors and we'd sample from them, upsample uh, or oversample these individuals. But that introduces a problem because you're basically having a lot of clones of the same handful of individuals. That's no good for your data hygiene. Um, so you could say, all right, well, let's create um, a fake individual and you add a little bit of variability uh, to this descriptor. And now you create um, artificial descriptors that vary in some way. Okay, that could work. But again, if you have a small sample size, it might not be enough for you uh, to do this sort of generative uh, approach. And then you can always take that last thing and just say, you know what, maybe we're not going to do this and just leave it at that. Uh, so here, that's all I had to say, and we'll stop there. And I encourage you to read these and uh, do your happy dance. And if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to me.